Hello, my name is Eric Moore. I'm a head and neck surgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'd like to spend some time with one of my excellent partners talking about salivary gland tumors, particularly parotid tumors, and what patients need to know if they end up with a parotid salivary gland tumor. And hello, my name is Jeff Janis. I'm a head and neck reconstructive surgeon and um, salivary tumor specialist here at uh, Mayo Clinic, Florida. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of discussing some questions that we've compiled from our patients regarding the treatment of parotid tumors. So I've got a list right here. We'll fall right into it. And um, I guess the first question that we get a lot of um, is what is the parotid? So Dr. Moore, would you be able to answer that? The parotid gland is a salivary gland, one of the major salivary glands that we have in our body. And the reason it's named parotid gland is because it sits around the ear. Parotid is Latin for near the ear. And the parotid gland sits underneath the cheek skin near the ear and comes down a little bit below the jawline into the neck. The parotid glands are paired. There's one on each side. They're part of the major salivary gland system. We have other major salivary glands under our jaw, the submandibular glands, under our tongue, the sublingual glands. And then we have a lot of salivary glands in our mouth and in our throat called the minor salivary glands. The parotid gland though is interesting because the majority of tumors that occur in the salivary glands occur in the parotid gland. So the parotid gland will come up much more in our practice and in a patient's life uh, presenting as a tumor than the other salivary glands. So Dr. Janis, if a patient notices a lump in their parotid gland area, what is your advice to them? Well, you know, um, if there's a lump in the parotid gland area, um, it's possible that it's a parotid tumor. I think, you know, one of, one of my mentors said that anything that's periparotid, meaning around the parotid, uh, is a parotid gland tumor until proven otherwise. And so um, my advice to them would be uh, to talk to their primary physician uh, or get an e a referral to an ENT doctor to investigate uh, that mass and see whether or not it was a parotid tumor. In the event that it's a parotid tumor, you know, about 80% of those are benign, about 20% of those are malignant. And so determining whether or not a mass around the ear or over the angle of the jaw or even in the upper neck, uh, determining whether that's a tumor is of critical importance. Uh, why, why is it that our mentors have taught us if it's anywhere near the parotid gland, you should consider that it's in the parotid gland. And why is it important for the patient when they have a lump in that area to see someone who specializes in parotid gland tumors rather than a more general practitioner or even a more general head and neck surgeon who doesn't see these tumors as often? Well, I think, you know, when I'm teaching residents and, or, or other people about parotid tumors, I think that the, the big factor is that the anatomic boundaries of the parotid gland, I think, are oftentimes underestimated. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, you can have a tumor that's as far forward in your cheek as, you know, over, you know, over the teeth or over the master muscle, which is right here. And it can seem like something that's just underneath the skin, when in actuality, it's, it's, a, it's a parotid tumor. Um, likewise, for things that are in the upper neck, you know, oftentimes we get consulta uh, consultations for neck masses, and in actuality, these are parotid tumors that are hanging very low, um, you know, uh, in the upper neck, below the angle of the jaw, and have the appearance of a neck mass when in actuality they're a parotid tumor. And you know, we'll get into this in a minute, but the the you know, if someone were to to operate on this or try and take this out thinking it was a simple cyst or something else and not realize that it was a parotid tumor, the consequences could be pretty dire. You know, the facial nerve runs right through the substance of the parotid gland. And so, um, you know, treating anything that's around the parotid gland as a parotid mass until proven otherwise, I think is of paramount importance. So Dr. Moore, if you, you know, if someone thought they had a parotid mass or their, their primary doctor thought they had a parotid mass, what, what imaging options or what kind of a workup do you think would be appropriate for that person? Yeah, if we're considering a lump that's in the parotid gland, we have this in the back of our minds, this what we call the differential diagnosis of this could be a primary tumor starting in the parotid gland. Tumor just means a growth uh, that's abnormal. It doesn't 
mean that it's benign or non-cancerous or malignant or cancerous. Uh, it means that we're considering the diagnosis of a lump in the parotid gland. And as a, 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 a surgeon evaluating that patient, we really want to get down to what's causing that lump. And so we'll use a, a combination of historical factors. And by that, I mean, we'll ask the patient a bunch of probing questions as far as when did it occur? How long have you had it? What's been the trajectory? Has it been rapidly growing or has it been there for a long time and slowly changing? Do you have pain with it? Or is it just feel like a lump that's totally insensate uh, and not painful? Do you have any problems with that all important facial nerve that runs through the parotid gland? So are you having trouble smiling symmetrically or moving your cheek or raising your eyebrows or blinking your eye on that sign? All those functions are driven by that facial nerve that runs right through the center of the parotid gland. And what we're trying to get to with those questions are, we're trying to get a picture in our mind. Is this one of the most common things that would occur in the parotid gland, a benign tumor? Or is this one of the less common things that would occur in the parotid gland, potentially a parotid cancer, because we'll treat those differently. And then you bring up an excellent point. What else do you do for the, for the workup? How do you get closer to that answer? And usually that consists of a physical examination. We wanna feel the tumor and feel its consistency. Is it hard like your knuckle or is it softer like the fleshy part of your hand? That'll give us some information. Do we think it's fluid filled and cystic like a balloon or is it solid and very firm? That'll give us more information. Uh, are there any problems with that facial nerve? Is the skin overlying the tumor feel hard or involved or is it freely mobile over the parotid gland? Are there any lumps in the neck that might be lymph nodes associated with that parotid gland indicating a more ominous process? And then we very often go to some type of imaging study. And the imaging studies can be dictated by the, the local environment and what's readily available quickly. Uh, it can be dictated by our suspicion and what we're trying to get out of that imaging study. But imaging studies would typically consist of some uh, uh, choice of ultrasound examination of the parotid gland. Ultrasound is very readily available to many practitioners. It's easy to acquire, easy for the patient to undergo. It might be consist of CT scan. CT scan gives a lot of great anatomic detail and tells us what's not only in the parotid gland, but what's around the parotid gland, or even MRI scan, which is a little bit longer study, a little bit more expensive, maybe a little bit harder for the patient to undergo because they have to lie still for a longer period of time, but very great detailed anatomy of the nerves and blood vessels that are surrounding the parotid gland. So I think imaging comes down to um, what are we trying to get out of that, out of that study and, and what are we considering in the diagnosis of this patient? And then another question that really often comes up, Dr. Janice, is should I have a biopsy? And if so, how should that biopsy be performed? Yeah, and the biopsy is a little bit tricky in, in, in my mind. You know, I, I think that a biopsy can provide, provide a lot of useful information you know, in the form of an FNA and, also, and oftentimes Individuals will get ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, sticking a needle into where they know um, the tumor is, or even practitioners in the community will get biopsies just doing it freehand. Uh, fine needle aspiration, you know, I always tell patients that, you know, a fine needle aspiration is really just sort of a, a, a mosaic of what's going on. It doesn't really give you the architecture or in, term, or in pathologic terms, you know, cytoarchitecture uh, to be able to determine what something is definitively. You look at large retrospective analyses or even large meta-analyses of FNA as it applies to, to you know, parotid tumors, and FNA means fine needle aspiration, the needle biopsy of the tumor. Um, when you look at these large meta-analyses, there is an error rate, you know, for malignancy versus benign tumor, and that, that error rate ranges somewhere in the 2 to 10 percent range, depending on who, who you read. Um, and that can be, that can make a critical difference, I think, for patients. You know, I, I really hate, you know, in my mind, the thing I fear the most is that somebody gets a biopsy of a parotid tumor and they're told that it's benign and they walk around with it for six months because it's surgery is not convenient or whatever. And then they ultimately get surgery and uh, it shows that it's, it was a malignancy and even worse, a malignancy maybe that has spread elsewhere in the body now. Um, you know, and, and honestly, a, a success rate of a biopsy being able to tell whether something is benign or malignant of 95 to 98% is, is great when you do five or six parotids a year. But, you know, I know a lot about your practice, Dr. Moore, and my practice is very similar, and we do two or three parotids a week, you know. And so 
in that context, you're telling somebody once a month that their biopsy was wrong. Um, and so um, the FNA can be used to provide useful information. I'll often get it in patients that may be too sick to have their mask removed. But in the end, if somebody's got a lump in their face and they're going to tell me to take it out anyway, um, if I'm not worried that it's a malignancy, I'm fairly certain it's a benign tumor, I'll just uh, I'll sometimes skip the FNA and go straight to surgery. Um, can you um, tell us how that's possible to skip the FNA and go to surgery when, when most of us as head and neck surgeons say, you know, we really want to know the diagnosis when we treat and, and particularly in parotid tumors, the dreaded situation is that you think you're dealing with a benign tumor and find out that you're dealing with a malignant tumor. How do you skip the FNA and deal with that situation in your practice? That's a wonderful question. And I think that really uh, pivots on a lot of the resources we have here at Mayo Clinic, you know, and, 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 and you know, one of those, one of the big resources that, that I know you and I both use to help uh, dictate or guide what we do in the operating room is frozen section pathology. Frozen section pathology is the ability for us to uh, look at tumors under the microscope while we're actively operating. What that means for patients is as soon as we take your parotid tumor out, we send it down the hall to the pathologist. Oftentimes the surgeons at Mayo Clinic will actually physically walk their own specimens down to the pathologist. Have the pathologist freeze it, cut it up, look at it under the microscope and determine whether or not it has features that are worrisome for a cancer. In the event that it's a cancer, uh, we would almost always, particularly high-grade cancers for par parotid tumors, we would almost always do more, meaning that we would remove perhaps the rest of the gland or remove some uh, lymph nodes in the upper neck. Um, and so, you know, basically the way that I tell patients to think about it is kind of like, it's very akin to Mohs surgery in, in some aspects. It's, uh, it's the ability for us to continue operating to do the surgery that needs to be done while you're still asleep in one operation. And that I think is incredibly valuable to patients. And since I have that resource, I don't always have to get the FNA. And even if I have an FNA, oftentimes I'll tell patients, hey, if we're in the operating room and I discover that this is a bad actor, we'll, we'll do more surgery if we need to, to get the job done. That whole process that you just described there called frozen section pathology, where you have the pathologist in the operating suite with you and you walk the tumor down and have a conversation with the pathologist about what you're thinking and what you're worried about, and then have them be able to cut up that tumor, stain it, look at it under the microscope, and give you an answer back in 10 minutes, Dr. Janice, this tumor is this, which is exactly what you were thinking, or this tumor is something different uh, than what you were thinking, is so critical. And I just want to make that emphasis that this isn't readily available to every single person, and, and even if it is, frozen section pathology on salivary gland tumors is so difficult for the pathologist to perfect and learn. And this process, uh, which was actually defined at the Mayo Clinic, uh, has been perfected to the point where our frozen section pathologist, it, it's, it's incredibly rare that they can't make that diagnosis at the time of the operation. And as you know, we, 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 we say we live and die by that every day in the operating room. The ability for them to tell us what, what that tumor is and what we need to do next at that operation avoids the situation for the patient where we find out a week later, oh, it wasn't a benign tumor, it was malignant, and now we have to go back and do something more that we would have done had we known that, uh, which, is, which is not only disappointing, but actually sometimes even detrimental and harmful to the patient to have to go back into that, into that field. So, if I didn't have frozen section pathology like you do at my institution, I probably would do a lot more fine needle aspiration biopsy to try to get that answer. But the, fine, the frozen section pathology is so accurate in these situations uh, that we avoid that error rate and that, that misstep. What if the tumor is benign on fine needle aspiration biopsy? Because I get this, patient a lot, uh, this question a lot from patients. They, uh, I was told the tumor was benign, so I don't need to do anything about that. What are the hallmarks of a benign tumor in the parotid gland? Why do you have to treat it? Yeah, so, you know, uh, the, as far as, as things I ask patients about to determine clinically whether something's benign or malignant, they, we always talk about the five Ps of parotid surgery, you know. So clinically, if someone has no evidence of paralysis, we meaning that the, the side of their face doesn't work much like somebody who has a Bell's palsy, if someone doesn't have paresthesias, which is a fancy doctor word for numbness or tingling, or even the feeling of ants crawling underneath the skin on the side of their face. 
um, that, you know, if they've got numbness or tingling or, or, or that feeling, sometimes that can be indicative of, of a more malignant process. If something is growing precipitously, someone has a previous history of skin cancers, um, or if somebody has um, palpable lymph nodes <laughs> in the neck is the last one. And, um, and so if there's any indicative, uh, any of those clinical signs or symptoms that something bad is happening, then, um, you know, we, uh, we're, I think we're more inclined to, uh, to, to, op to, op to operate sooner rather than later. Even if something is benign, um, you know, if something's a pleomorphic adenoma on the FNA and, and patients have been told before that they don't need to do anything about their parotid tumor, um, there, there is actually, specifically for pleomorphic adenomas, uh, a conversion rate for some of these tumors over the course of a long period of time where they can become something more, more sinister uh, called a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, that can actually spread elsewhere in the body and behave uh, uh, poorly and be actually pretty difficult to treat. And so, you know, in that, in that context, I, 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 I almost always take pleomorphic adenomas out. And I think that, you know, since we do a lot of parotid surgery, I think my, my comfort level with doing that is, 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 is very good. Um, maybe more so than someone that's treating in the community, but um, I'm almost always, even for pleomorphic adenomas or other benign tumors in the parotid gland, um, uh, take it out sooner rather than later to avoid that, that conversion rate. Um, Dr. Moore, in your, in your mind, you know, if somebody has a parotid tumor, but benign or malignant, like how, how do you feel like most of those are treated? The parotid gland tumors uh, are very interesting in that we, for most tumors in the body, we have some choices of treatment. We, we can take those tumors out surgically through, through a more invasive or less invasive type of surgical procedure. For most tumors in the body, we could also apply a medical treatment for very many of them and reduce the size of them or even expect them to go away with medication, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, some other type of medication. We could apply radiation therapy and eliminate that tumor, or stop the growth of it or decrease the size of it. For, for the salivary gland parotid tumors, there aren't any other good treatments that reliably give you the diagnosis and eliminate the disease process and allow the patient to go on and recover and live a full life other than surgically removing that tumor. And as you mentioned, even the benign tumors have some noxious long-term effects to them that they could transition into a more aggressive malignant type of tumor. So we're trying to avoid that, even though that's not common for most of the benign tumors, the most benign common benign tumor in the parotid gland, the pleomorphic adenoma has this association that some of them will degenerate into a malignant tumor if you leave them long enough time. Mm -hmm. But the other interesting thing about salivary gland tumors is they really sit on that border between an oncologic or tumor process and a cosmetic process, which is what's so unique about salivary gland tumors that cause a tumor that occurs right here in the middle of your face that you look at and everybody else looks at every single day. This raises some particular nuances in salivary gland tumors. For one, you don't wanna ignore even a benign tumor because you don't want that to progress and grow and wind up with the proverbial fruit size, grapefruit size tumor on the side of your cheek. It's just gonna become more obvious, more difficult to treat, more complicated, the longer you leave it. So, so it's, a, it's a very anxiety provoking process in a patient to go in and think, I'm going to have an incision and, and a tumor taken off of my face. But the alternative of letting it sit there is, is even less attractive uh, from an option standpoint. So surgical treatment is the short answer to that question, is the treatment for parotid gland tumors. But then we get into a really interesting topic as far as how much surgery and what kind of surgical treatment. So can you talk about how you counsel patients and how you talk about incisions that you're gonna make and extent of surgery? Yeah, so um, the typical approach and the, the approach that I use for the removal of a parotid tumor is the modified Blair incision. The modified Blair incision is an incision that drops down in front of the ear, goes back um, behind the jawline and into a pre-existing neck crease. This is a great incision because it can be extended in the event that, um, that we do find something that's more sinister and have to do more in the way of removing lymph nodes. We can simply extend that incision into the neck crease and it heals beautifully. Um, honestly, it's a facelift incision, a traditional facelift incision. And uh, in most patients, you know, six to 12 months after surgery are none the wiser that we did surgery on them. Um, and I offer every patient that I do that incision on because some of them are obviously nervous, I offer them a scar revision 
Um, and after doing hundreds of these cases, I've had, had zero people pick, uh, uh, pick me up on the offer to revise their scar at six to 12 months if they don't like it. So it's very well tolerated, the modified glare incision. The extent of surgery is based on what we find, right? So uh, if we find a um, you know, benign tumor, it's confirmed on frozen section pathology, then a superficial parotidectomy or even a limited parotidectomy, just taking out the part of the parotid gland that has the tumor in it is a, an appropriate um, treatment for the removal of that, term, uh, that tumor long-term. In, in cases of high-grade malignancy, we tend to remove all of the parotid tissue. And that's complex because it involves dissecting underneath the facial nerve. We call it working under the net. And that, that, um, that is a very delicate procedure um, because you have to work underneath the facial nerve while respecting the facial nerve and protecting the facial nerve. Um, but that will oftentimes happen in cases of high-grade malignancy and removal of the upper neck lymph nodes called a neck dissection is something that we do not only as part of this surgery, but as part of many other head and neck surgeries. It's one of the most common things that most head and neck surgeons do. The, the five real side effects of parotid surgery that I counsel patients on um, are as follows. Um, number one is numbness. And that's the one that people notice the most, I think, after this, this surgery. They get, people get numbness that can be fairly dense in front of their ear, in some of their upper neck, and definitely around their, their earlobe. Some of that numbness can be long lasting or even permanent, um, but the, most of the time that entire field that's densely numb right after surgery gets far better over the course of time, maybe with some residual numbness in the earlobe in select cases. As a matter of fact, you know, we, I think, sometimes go out of our way to spare the greater auricular nerve, which is responsible for some of the ear numbness and is oftentimes cut in parotid surgery um, many of um, the surgeons here at Mayo Clinic, I know at Mayo Clinic Rochester as well, go out of their way to spare that nerve to, to curb some of that numbness if it can be spared. Additionally, Does sparing that nerve uh, eliminate that numbness that you talked about around the cheek and around the ear. Uh, it doesn't completely el eliminate it in the immediate post-operative period. Long term, I think it helps quite a bit. But anytime you manipulate that nerve heavily to get the, the, the parotid gland out of there. Uh, people are going to have some immediate, immediate post-op numbness. And I think that people are so worried about the facial paralysis, and, and I see you nodding your head, Dr. Moore, as people are so worried about the facial paralysis and we talk about this numbness, um, it doesn't really register as a, as a, as a, as a uh, significant side effect of parotid surgery, um, but that's the number one thing that people complain about because most of the time we do such a good job of sparing the facial nerve that the weakness you know, the motor weakness, you know, the, where, where you can't blink your eye or smile as well, whatever, is very minimal after these surgeries and experienced hands. And so the numbness is the thing that shines. It's the, what people notice the most. The, the reason I'm smiling is I'm trying to figure out how many times to repeat this statement because you're exactly right. In the preoperative discussion, the, the discussion frequently circulates around, is my face going to move or is it not going to move after the operation? Am I going to have any dreaded facial paresis or paralysis? But after the operation, the most common question that I get when I, when I talk to people a few weeks after surgery is, when is this numbness going to go away? And, and the reason I point this out is that even with great auricular nerve sparing, the very act of lifting up the skin over the parotid gland or anywhere in the body will cause some numbness to the touch, which is an entirely different nerve process than the facial nerve. And then that numbness will be long-term, one of the slowest things to go away. I often counsel patients that it may take several weeks to months before they're face and ear feels normal again, but that is a natural healing process of, of uh, the parotid uh, uh, tumor removal. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and, and I get where people are coming from, you know, and, and, and honestly, the facial weakness is a good segue to facial weakness, you know, and um, I think, you know, we've between the a uh, team of people in the room who are experienced at looking at the face while we operate and, and, and are able to tell us when we get any stimulation on the face at all while we're identifying and preserving the facial nerve. And the machine that we use now, the neural monitoring machine that has four leads that are placed into the face to monitor the face for even, even subclinical movement, even movement that we can't detect with our eyes. The, machine, the machinery and the um, technology and um, the surgeons are so, uh, you know, experienced with doing this, 
um, that facial weakness really has gone from a very common side effect of carotid surgery, uh, you know, uh, to, to something that can be relatively minimal, particularly in cases of superficial parotidectomy, where we're just taking out a standard parotid tumor in the tail of the gland or something like that. You know, I would say partial facial weakness, you know, maybe along the, the, the corner of the mouth, maybe happens in 10% of cases, um, you know, in experienced, in experienced hands now. Um, and so the facial weakness, I feel like, is something that patients are very concerned about because they read about it a lot on the internet and they're doing their due diligence, you know, they're doing their research and I respect and admire that, um, but it's something that I think they, they gloss over things like the numbness, I completely agree. So um, with respect to other uh, side effects of parotid surgery, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Moore, I think people will probably also do some reading about things like first bite syndrome. What's your, what's your take on that? How often does that happen? The first bite syndrome uh, is a really interesting phenomenon after parotid surgery in that um, it's, it's named first bite because people will experience it with the first chew uh, or bite of food that they take, and then it will diminish after that. And the, the um, easiest way to understand first bite uh, syndrome is that it's a, it's a rapid, strong egress of saliva out of the parotid gland that's unregulated or unopposed by the normal uh, salivary process. So when we first start to think about food or eat, our, our parotid gland uh, is, is stimulated and it secretes and, and propels saliva into the mouth as a reflexive response. And that is a balanced reflective response to deliver a, a, an amount of saliva. But sometimes after surgery, that balance becomes uh, imbalanced and people will get a very rapid um, squeeze of the parotid gland and egress of that saliva into the mouth, and it'll actually feel painful, uh, like sucking on the most sour candy you've ever sucked on every time you take a first bite of food, and people start to anticipate it and become even more um, debilitated by it. It's uncommon in most parotid surgery, and it's most common when you approach the, what's called the deep portion of the parotid gland or the parapharyngeal portion of the parotid gland, which is where parotid tumors can occur underneath the jawbone. The reason for that is that the nerves that come into the parotid gland from that area are some of the nerves that allow that balance and those nerves can be upset by removing portions of the deep parotid gland or parapharyngeal parotid gland. So I always talk to patients about first bite syndrome that they're gonna have it much more commonly when we're talking about those deep parotid tumors, which are, which are a small fraction of the overall parotid tumors. But first bite, same pain when people have it is debilitating and it causes discomfort. Uh, there are some ways to manage it. There are some ways to treat it. And in my practice, and I'm sure you've had this experience, some patients are much more bothered by it than others. And it's those patients who are really having a, a troublesome and prolonged amount of first bite pain that we start thinking about Botox injection to the parotid gland or neuropathic medication to try to help with that first bite pain. Um, but most patients who undergo parotidectomy, fortunately, are not afflicted with first bite pain. And most patients that are afflicted, it's a temporary phenomena that will gradually resolve, fortunately. Completely agree with that. What about Fry syndrome? Because this is something that I also get asked a lot about and people who become more educated about parotid uh, gland surgery say, what's the chance of me getting Fry syndrome? And and, and what will that be like? Yeah, so uh, Fry syndrome is a, uh, an interesting neurophysiologic phenomenon where some of the, um, the signaling neurotransmitter um, that would normally signal the parotid gland to salivate actually is picked up by the sweat glands in the skin. And so what that means to patients is that when they start to eat after things like a superficial parotidectomy, they might feel like their parotid is leaking. It's something that we'll get calls about or, or um, you know, calls or questions about. Uh, or that they've got sweating on the side of their face or that they've got redness on the side of their face where they had their surgery. Um, that happens, I think, you know, in about 20 to 30% of cases, it happens enough that people notice and, and actually comment on it. Um, and tends to wane over the course of time. I think if we were supposed, to, if we were doing the legitimate test for the, you know, for Fry syndrome, that being uh, a, a sweat iodine test, where we actually put, or a starch iodine test, where we actually put starch and iodine on the side of the face and have people eat something that's sour, I think we would discover that it happens a lot more. Um, I would say, however, in 
in super, you doing superficial parodectomy, I would say that the number of people that actually call in and complain about, hey, like I'm, I'm having intolerable sweating on the side of my face that when, when I eat is very minimal. I probably in the last year have had maybe one or two people call. So I think it happens. It tends to be self, in many cases, tends to be self-limiting in nature. It's uh, very rarely, I think, it happens enough that it's debilitating. Uh, but I think if you were to do the formal test for it, you would discover that it's happening a lot more than we realize. That's, that's a long answer, but I guess the short answer is it happens. It doesn't happen so much that we need to do anything about it, but maybe once or twice a year. And there are options to treat it when it does happen. Um, you can, again, inject Botox into the uh, skin by carefully mapping out the area that's afflicted with this, you know, by doing that starch iodine test and map out the skin where, where the patient is sweating when they eat, when they eat, and then injecting those areas with some units of Botox to curb uh, the effect of, of sweating um, uh, when when the patient's eating. So. You bring up an excellent point uh, that I want to explore a little bit uh, because you said you know if you if you test for it we would see this quite often and even if you ask patients about it uh, you'll pick it up uh, up to twenty percent of the time. Why is it that that you read about Fry syndrome never happens in this operation or only happens two percent of the time and 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 how do you explain those discrepancies and and then you bring up another excellent point that I want to emphasize is that most of the time people are concerned that their parotid gland incision is leaking saliva. And so the, the reassurance that it's not saliva, it's actually a trickle of sweat uh, is many times all the reassurance that's necessary. And I actually treat very, very, very infrequently uh, people for Fry syndrome that's debilitating um, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon, but it's a fairly mild phenomenon. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the point is it's mild and most people, I think it's it's self-limiting in nature, or sometimes it's so mild that it goes unrecognized, all, all these things kind of, and you, and you alluded to that. I think that when it does happen, it's so minor, so minor or so self-limiting that people don't call and complain about it. And that's, I think, the big factor where, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at formal reporting of people reporting Fry syndrome, it's quite low. But if you were to physically ask patients in clinic whether they've had any of this, sometimes they'd be like, oh yeah, I had that for a little bit and then it kind of went away, or oh yeah, I, I didn't know what that was. So. I think it happens a little bit more common than we realize, but I don't think it happens in a fashion that's debilitating to one's life. Um, the last thing that it can happen, I think that people read about Dr. Moore with, with, with parotid surgery is, is contour deformity, meaning that they, they're gonna, their face, the, the topography or the geography of their face is gonna look different after their gland is removed. And I know that we, you know, we, you and I both do things to try and curb this or to treat this in the operating room. And, and could you comment on, on that? So the parotid gland uh, has some substance to it and it forms some of our facial structure. And this is where we get into that uh, balance again between, between a, a tumor surgery and a cosmetic surgery and how to, how to balance the um, desired effects of that and the extent of that. Um, one of the uh, things I often tell people is, you know, everybody's parotid gland is a different thickness and size and shape. It's an individual as a, as a thumbprint or a palm print. But the parotid gland is often as thick as the palm of my hand uh, uh, is in its substance um, from the skin down to the jaw. And so if you take out portions of the parotid gland, uh, you're going to have some contour irregularity between the two sides of the face. Historically, even with full extent of superficial parotidectomy, the scar tissue that forms the rigidity, the skin, um, the, the, the minor asymmetries that occur have led most surgeons to say, it's a very mild asymmetry uh, in limited parotidectomy uh, and, and reconstruction pays small dividends, but may not be absolutely necessary even in superficial parotidectomies. When you start to think about taking out the entire parotid gland, then you have a, 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 an inarguable asymmetry between the two sides of the face and reconstruction to regain that symmetry um, becomes of higher import. But, I think that this philosophy is, is changing a little bit and pendulums are swinging and, and for various reasons, it's become a major uh, topic of, of symmetry after parotidectomy and how to reconstruct the defect. And so there are multiple options that are at our disposal. The first option is extent of parotidectomy. So the less parotid gland you remove, 
the less asymmetry you're going to have. And so I don't think we can even have a discussion of, of reconstruction without acknowledging it's less of an issue when you take out less and less and less parotid gland. And so a lot of the uh, pendulum is swinging, I think, towards, towards more limited parotidectomy, particularly for benign tumors. And um, it, it, in, the, in the small volume parotid tumors, you can often recontour that gland, sew edges together, reposition it, and minimize your, your asymmetry. But there are a lot of tumors that require you to do, to do more than just very limited parotidectomy. So when you start to have more superficial, um, full lateral gland removal and beyond, and you're dealing with asymmetry, you know, you, you wrote an excellent uh, um, paper on, on reconstruction of the parotid bed with dermal fat grafting. And dermal fat grafting is something that's been around for a long time and used at various periods for parotid reconstruction, but I think it has one of the greatest utilities as far as its durability, the ability to contour it and tailor it to the patient uh, and um, hold up over time, even with uh, additional treatment like radiation therapy and can give you excellent symmetry with a fairly mild um, cosmetic, what we call the donor site defect of where you take that dermal fat graft from. In fact, many patients, when I say I'm going to take a dermal fat graft, their eyes light up and they say, oh, great, I'm going to get some body contouring out of this. And can we, can we take some from here and here and things like this? Unfortunately, we need very little fat to reconstruct the parotid defect, but it's an excellent resource for us. There are many other uh, ways to reconstruct the parotid defect. Um, there are what we call off-the-shelf materials that, that you don't have to harvest from the patient that you can put into the parotid defect. In my experience, a lot of the off-the-shelf materials, unfortunately, don't have a lot of longevity to them, so they don't hold up so great over time and start to resorb, uh, and you lose some of the benefit. Um, you can shift muscle and fascia from around the parotid defect into the parotid defect, and recontour that way. You can, uh, for complete parotidectomies, where you've taken a lot of tissue, harvest entire vascularized grafts from one part of the body to another to fill in that deficit. So um, I think most of us who do a lot of parotid surgery would say, you know, you have to tailor the reconstruction to the extent of the defect and balance that with the patient's desires and, and balance that delicate balance of donor site morbidity of where you're going to take the graft from to recipient site benefit, um, but, but definitely something to consider the more and more parotid gland you remove. What about when the patient has, uh, a, say, a total parotidectomy defect or what we call an extended parotidectomy, and the, the tumor, most of the time in malignant tumors, has involved parts of, uh, or, or all of the facial nerve? Can you talk a little bit about about what happens when you have to start dealing with the facial nerve and cancer surgery and, and what the effects of that are, what your options are for rehabilitation. Yeah, so this is obviously everyone's main worry, I think, when they come into clinic, particularly if they've got a malignant tumor, is that part or all of their nerve is involved. And certainly when people show up and they have facial weakness at presentation, that's, that's sort of a, a warning side that, um, that we may be dealing with something that's, that's involving the nerve. Um, I think that a, a, as parotid surgeons, we have to be uh, uh, ready, willing, and able uh, to, to sacrifice the facial nerve it's, if it's grossly involved with tumor. This is something that's not taken lightly, you know, and, 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 and as, a, as a focal point and topic of dis discussion with patients in clinic frequently. Uh, I think that you and I and anybody else that does this uh, feel that it, we wouldn't take the facial nerve or sacrifice unless we absolutely needed to. The problem is that a lot of these tumors that are involving the facial nerve, a fair amount of them actually, are higher grade, and some of them are even neurotropic, meaning that they love the nerve and they'll crawl along that nerve and get into places where they shouldn't go, like your brainstem. So data would support, you know, based on, on just looking at the literature as a whole, removing the facial nerve to, to the point that you have ne negative margins and being able to reconstruct that. You know, there's lots of different ways that people can approach re facial reanimation or reconstruction in the context of having the facial nerve missing. Uh, the first of these is just simply cable grafting, meaning that we're borrowing a nerve uh, from elsewhere in your body, either the leg, which has a nerve called the sural nerve, or even the neck, which has uh, that greater auricular nerve that we mentioned earlier, and using that as an interposition graft, connecting where the uh, healthy nerve stops as it comes out of the skull base, 
and connecting it to the, the remaining nerve that you have um, as it goes uh, to its terminal point in the muscles of the face. That cable graft, you know, uh, the real hope of that cable graft in many instances is just to be able to get people to where at rest they look normal again. And that can take a very long time to heal on the order of many, many months to even years. Um, some other options for reconstructing that area are static procedures, putting a, a weight in the eyelid so that it can close fully, doing a brow lift so that you, your, your brow doesn't crowd the orbit or block your vision um, as it sags under the weight of gravity after the, after the brow doesn't work anymore. Um, there are instances and something that I'm a fan of, of actually using dual innervation, you know, using that cable graph to go from the facial nerve stump to the upper division and then using the lower division and plugging it into a, a motor muscle that goes to a, a motor nerve that goes to one of your muscles, your chewing muscles called the master muscle. Um, I've started doing that a lot in the rare instances that we have to remove somebody's facial nerve. Um, that way we can avoid something that's called synkinesis, meaning that your face moves in many areas when you're trying to only move one. So there are lots of different options for this and these options for uh, facial nerve restoration and, and, and grafting and trying to get you to look normal at rest and even be able to have some expressive mobility of your face long after the, we've dealt with the, the cancer, you know, the, the thing that's the most pressing and the most dangerous, but being able to re restore some facial function uh, in a way that you look normal on, uh, day to day and can express on that side of the face um, is something that's refined and has been, you know, I think that's, that's uh, changed a lot over the course of my practice and, um, and uh, ha has become a, a real focal point of, 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 of my practice and my research. Um, that has to be balanced with obvious, the, obviously the other things that happen, you know, you talked earlier about doing some grafting uh, enable, uh, to be able to restore facial contour, you know, to, to not have people not look deformed after surgery. And so we balance, you know, facial nerve restoration with contour restoration with appropriate margins and appropriate cancer surgery to have you, uh, to get you the best chances of success long-term at beating your cancer. And I think you bring up some really excellent points here in this in this just segment of this discussion. And so, you know, we've talked about uh, some of the intricacies and heterogeneity of the tumor, how important it is to know the pathology at the time of the operation using your frozen section pathologist. The, the issue of if the nerve is involved with tumor, the game has all changed and, and the ability to tell you know, millimeter by millimeter when you're beyond that tumor into healthy nerve can not only make the difference between the patient's function later on, but now we're talking about whether it makes a difference between tumor recurrence and life and death. And, and so all of these really intricate concepts and the number of tools that you have to have at your disposal from, from making a decision uh, in a complex situation to the number of curves that the tumor will throw at you in relationship to the facial nerve and how to reconstruct all those different areas with, with what we call non-vascularized, um, just free grafts to microvascular intricate surgeries that reconstruct the bed and the facial nerve. And so I guess the point I'm making here is that there, there's no simple parotid gland surgery, right? And, no. and the take home message for the patient is, is this can be a real morass of, of, of problems and, and the things that you've discussed have come about from years of training and experience and hundreds of up to thousands of cases that you've been involved with to help you make good decisions for that patient at the moment. And so if you're a patient with a parotid tumor, you need to take this to a person who has a lot of experience is the take home message. There's gonna be all kinds of issues that come up and, and you don't wanna get into the situation of, oh, this was done and had I had it done a different way or had we known this before, we would have done something totally different. One of the things I always tell patients is the time to get this right is the very first time that we operate. And we're constantly just playing catch up after that and trying to make the best of sometimes a difficult situation. And so, so seeking out an experienced practitioner with all these tools at your disposal. And I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't excellent surgeons that can do a great job in, in places that, that don't have all these amenities, but all these other services that are, that are crucial to the outcome 
are only available in a limited number of places is really probably a good decision making process for this particular tumor. Yeah, I completely agree. Bar barotid tumors as a whole are, are relatively rare and barotid cancers are rare or still. I think that there, there's a lot of value in experience. Um, and so I, I completely agree with you. I think that going to a, a place that has, has a lot, has a, has a depth and breadth of experience and, and personnel and people who can look at the pathology and know what they're know what they're looking at and people who can interpret frozen section pathology and know what they're looking at plays a, a huge role in being able to treat these successfully. So I have a question for you that's really unique to this period of time in our lives. So we're in the midst of a global pandemic and and it's not only affecting people's ability to travel, affecting their work, affecting their economics, but it's causing a unique problem in the healthcare system and that we're starting to see a lot of patients who have been unable to get care or avoided care because of, of issues surrounding this global pandemic. And I, I want to see if you could spend a few minutes on what's been done at your institution to make the environment safe for patients to be able to come and get an opinion and an evaluation and treatment and what your advice is to patients who develop something like a parotid tumor in the midst of this global pandemic? So, you know, I think, I think that's a great question. And obviously we're all feeling the effects of, of what's happening with COVID-19. I think probably the first and most important thing to mention is that you and I are both uh, in here uh, in the clinic on a Saturday in the safety of our own offices. And that's why we're not masked. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's a, a appropriate to, to mention in this, in, you know, in this kind of setting. Um, you know, patients ask a lot about this, and I've honestly, unfortunately, seen a lot of people, not only for parotid tumors, but for, um, for other cancers of the head and neck that have significantly delayed their care in the context of being afraid to come to the hospital. I, I, I think, you know, the, you know, many hospitals in the Mayo Clinic in, in particular has done a wonderful job of making this a very safe environment to treat patients. The staff all self-check and have to report whether or not they have a fever or any symptoms of COVID-19 every day. We have to do it digitally and submit this. All of us wear our masks all of the time when we're, when we're around patients or engaging in patient care, uh, very rarely take them off. I, uh, from the standpoint of surgery, every single one of our patients it, uh, has to get a nasal swab within 24 hours, uh, which means within 48 hours of, of, of surgery. And so every single person that goes into an operating room where you're gonna be has been tested negative for COVID-19. The COVID-19 patients are housed in a different wing of the hospital. Uh, they, they're a negative pressure unit and, and they don't, they're not on the same floor as other patients who are hospitalized overnight in the hospital. Um, we have strict sanitiz sanitization protocols and, and uh, have increased the level of sanitization that we're doing around the hospital. And obviously we, check, we temperature check and symptom check every single patient that walks in. This, the, the, this institution, as a whole, this enterprise, I think, is safer than any other place that you can go, uh, get, get in your, your, your car and drive to right now in the midst of this pandemic. And so I think that's on everybody's mind, but it's been sad to me personally to see people delay care and let things go unchecked for a long period of time um, because they're worried about going to the hospital. Um, and my advice to somebody who has a parotid tumor in this in this setting is, is get it checked out. You know, uh, give us a call and, and, and let us know how we can help you. And, and this is a safe place to come to. Everyone's worried about the same thing and everybody has your best interests in mind. I want to mention also, in, in addition to the excellent things that you just described about how great efforts have been taken at our institutions to make this a safe environment for patients to seek out care, come get, get care and leave safely. Uh, that this instance has opened up, um, I think, for uh, the better, an opportunity for patients also to seek care in that we can have these kinds of conversations with the patient uh, with the value of them being able to sit in their own home and us being able to sit in our office and sometimes shed some very important light on, on tumors like parotid tumors and make uh, some very accurate diagnoses and design a treatment plan um, that doesn't require the patient to even see me for the first time face to face. And so what I'm talking about, as you know, is telemedicine and telemedicine gives us the option uh, to deliver information and care uh, ultimately for parotid tumors 
uh, where our advice is going to be that most patients wind up in the operating room and at some point will have to leave their home uh, to have that care. But the initial uh, foray into, into the diagnosis and, and the information gathering and some of the, the information that we can deliver to the patient can be done through telemedicine, which I think is a great step forward for us. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you found yourself watching this video and, uh, and, and I would like to thank you for um, watching it and I hope it was useful to you. And I know that um, you know, Dr. Moore and I are incredibly passionate about salivary gland sur surgery and, 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 and love doing the cases. I'm sad that people have, the, I always tell patients, I'm sad you have the problem, but, but man, do I love doing these cases. And uh, it maybe sounds weird in a way, but um, but I know we're both passionate about doing these cases and love treating patients with parotid tumors and salivary tumors. Um, you know, feel free to connect with, uh, with either one of us or uh, with one of our colleagues or part of a group of individuals at each of these institutions. I think that's important to mention. There's lots of people at the Mayo Clinic as an enterprise who treat parotid tumors and do a wonderful job doing it and are well trained to do so and have similar resources. And so I think it's important to mention that we're part of a group of uh, a team of surgeons that are uh, that have a, a breadth and depth of experience here, and um, you know, feel free to connect with us. We'd love to help help you, and um, uh, and hope you found the video useful and helpful. And Dr. Moore, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I just want to thank all the people who viewed this for for uh, their attention, and um, uh, we're, I'm very fortunate to have partners like you, Dr. Janice, and and to share in these endeavors and. Um, uh, learn from our patients and deliver the best care we possibly can. Thanks. Thank you.